Hey everyone, so it's really happening. This is it. We are at the end of One Piece. Everything that is happening in this chapter between the last couple of chapters is end game stuff officially. The curtains are being pulled back. The world is about to find out the truth. We're about to find out the truth. We're about to learn void century information that I didn't think that we were going to get till till Robin was reading the last Poneglyph on Ohara or something like that. But it seems as though what I was telling people on stream, it seems as though the final reveals of the story are going to be broken up into three parts. Okay, first Vegapunk giving us the tip of the iceberg right now. With general information, he makes it very clear that we're not, he's not telling us everything about Joy Boy because he doesn't know everything about the Void Sentry, but he knows some. Next arc is Elbath. Elbath will allow us to expand on this lore because Elbath is the origin of the legend of the sun god Nika, and there are, of course, giants of Elbath, Saul there, of course, who are scholars who have the remnants of the Poneglyphs. So it seems as though Elbath is the next step into learning more about this lore. And it seems the final step, the final piece, will be at Laugh Tale, where Robin gives us the finishing touch of breaking down exactly what happened in the Void Century. So it seems like a three-part breakdown. The lore of One Piece is so elaborate, so complex, there is so much that Oda has thought out about this. I mean, it's a full century, it's a void century of events, that it seems as though we're going to be getting the full breakdown over the course of three separate arcs, at minimum. It's very possible that even beyond Laugh Tale, we might be at Marijua and still learning things. So, let's just sink it in. This is insane. <laughs> I, I, it feels surreal that this is happening at this point. I'm just going to take a step back and say that the chapter overall, I feel like we're going to be looking back at this moment of time in One Piece, the speech of Vegapunks, as one of the milestone moments of One Piece and one of the most iconic sections of the story. Because the way that Oda's executing all this is beyond masterclass. The idea that this is all happening post-mortem is, one, just much more powerful and much more dramatic and gives a sort of extra weight and somberness to the words that Vegapunk is putting out there. It would feel very different if Vegapunk was still alive and giving us all this information, but there's a sense of gravity to his words in the sense that this is his final message from literally beyond the grave. I talked last chapter about how much I love the narration. I love it even more this chapter. I love that the tone that Oda is setting, the atmosphere that he's setting with these words from Vegapunk echoing literally throughout the world, throughout all the major characters, all the major factions, all the major islands that we've seen, all the weight of all the information that we, the reader, have known for so long and have just been wanting, like itching for the people of the, the broader One Piece population to find out about it's all spilling out and everybody is tuned in and listening to it I like that that's the primary voice that we're hearing throughout the chapter everything else is sort of background noise little little bits and moments happening with the Gorsei talking to each other the Luffy and the Giants talking to each other but the majority of it is dictated by this one grander again from the heavens voice essentially just speaking the truth to the entire world it just gives a very dramatic feel to the whole chapter very cinematic I feel like this whole speech which we're not done with yet, it has a very different sort of scene direction to it than anything that Oda has done in the past, which is one of the things I've loved Egghead for, which is that it still feels like Oda is innovating in different ways in his storytelling methods, even this deep into the story and even this deep into his career as a mangaka. So the two big things from this chapter, aside from all the cutaways to characters, are the Mother Flame and the reveal that Joy Boy was a pirate. And I have a lot to say about Joy Boy being a pirate, and even more to say about the Mother Flame, but a lot of that will be saved for next Tuesday's video, which I think is a huge, huge, huge piece of how the Mother Flame fits into the Void Century conflict itself. Because I think a lot just came together with the reveal of what the Mother Flame looks like. The big clue that I'll just say right here that many people have already observed is that the Mother Flame, if you go back and look at the hieroglyphics during Anno's cover story, the Mother Flame looks remarkable similar in the terms of the way that Oda framed it, the circle around it, the sort of rings coming out of it, it looks remarkably similar to the image on the moon, the hieroglyphics that Enna was looking at, of a certain flame surrounded by a ring and various rays coming out of it. It is meant to look practically identical, and I think that simple piece of Oda drawing that visual similarity connects together so much about the Mother Flame. Not to mention the panel itself was just a very, very powerful panel. You get the sense that we are supposed to understand that this is something extremely, extremely important to the conflict of the world, the lore of the world, the future of the world, even if we don't fully understand it just yet. But again, I think a lot of things just connected. So please look out for next Tuesday's video. It is going to be a really, really, really big one. Now, Joy Boy being a pirate, I strongly recommend you guys to go watch two videos. 
First, that the true world of One Piece is buried under the sea, and second, the video I recently put out explaining exactly how One Piece ends. Both videos argued that the world of One Piece is in fact currently flooded already. Vegapunk did talk about how it's going to flood even further, thereby eclipsing all the islands and basically ending life as we know it, but there is a ton of evidence to suggest that even what we see right now is really just the tip of the true world of One Piece. The world has already been flooded at some point in the past, and what we're seeing are simply the remnants of it. The true world of One Piece is buried under the sea, and it is likely one one giant interconnected continent, much like Pangaea. I strongly recommend you go watch those two videos to understand what I'm talking about. Because the reveal that Joy Boy was the world's first true pirate strongly suggests that this was in fact the case. That the world was once one giant interconnected piece of land. Why do I say that? Well, what is a pirate? A pirate is simply anyone who takes to the sea and disobeys. Now. If the world was, you know, always just a bunch of islands 800 years ago, going back, you know, the world, imagine the world has been unchanged. It is as it is. We have countless hundreds of islands going back 800 years ago, because it would be essentially identical to the way the world is today, with people sailing in ships from island to island. It is literally impossible that there was not one single person who disobeyed and broke a rule while sailing the seas before Joy Boy. Unless nobody was sailing the seas at that point in time. If the world was one giant interconnected mass of land, then it could have been that the rule was simply that the kingdom is the kingdom. You stay within the confines of Pangaea. Much like Odin in Wano. If you think back to Odin and the rules that were imposed upon him in the flower capital, the idea is, you know, you've got Wano, one giant mass of land, and Odin simply wanted to set out to sea. Nobody else in Wano was allowed to leave and set out to sea. Odin kept trying to do so and failing, and he was essentially a prototype version of a pirate for Wano. He never really got out till Whitebeard helped him out, but he was attempting to essentially be the first pirate of Wano. Joy Boy's story might be identical. If there was one giant mass of land and essentially the rule was basically, look, we all live together in harmony on this land, nobody try and set off to the seas, then it makes sense how one man could have been the world's first pirate. It doesn't really make any sense in the modern day setup of One Piece where there's just a bunch and hundreds and hundreds of islands spread out across. It's like, how do you even identify who the first pirate would be if all these kingdoms are spread out and different people are sailing, traveling on ships? So the fact that Joy Boy was somehow recorded as being the first pirate ever on the seas means that back then, sailing the seas in general must have been very, very rare, or just straight up not done at all, which only makes sense if pretty much everybody lived on one giant mass of land and was happy there. So I'm very excited to learn more about the story of Joy Boy, which hopefully Oda will expand upon next chapter. Aside from that, we did get to take a good look at all of the different islands and characters of the world. Oda's still saving some reactions. I think it's very important to understand exactly how the Marines, in particular Akainu, is going to react to all this, because we could be heading towards a Marine defection from working for the Celestial Dragons if they find out the truth that everything is heading towards, which is that the world government is going to attempt to drown the world. We know, as Vegapunk gave us, a timeline is basically you get five shots out of this weapon and then basically the entire world is done for. So it seems like Oda is basically setting up the ticking time bomb, if you will, for the entire final saga right now. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see that developing more and more as the saga continues, so basically Luffy and the crew have basically one shot left before the world government uses the weapon one last time before they can save the world without everybody drowning. So chapter, amazing, the setup, amazing, and the lore reveals that we're about to get seem to be some of, if not the most significant lore reveals we've ever had in the entire story. And finally, there's some great points made by the voice of the people, my top tier of patrons. So Varun Vishwanath made a phenomenal point. The Denden Mushi is in the ancient giant. I love this idea because it makes too much sense and it is literally the perfect place to place the Denden Mushi to make sure that the Celestial Dragons, the Gorosei, basically can't get to it. I don't know if the ancient giant is indestructible or something or just if it's the last place that the Gorosei would bother to look, but so far the ancient giant has kind of been wandering around and we don't really know what to make of it or how it connects exactly to what's going on in the other events. This would make the perfect connection. It's not just this side piece that's walking around, the ancient giant is actually supposed to be the centerpiece of the action right now. It's just that nobody on either side has figured it out yet. So I love that idea. And Justin Holland said, 
Food pills with Sanji and Chopper working together with the Giants may be a solution to Luffy's gear stamina issues in the coming battles. So I like leaning towards Sanji more than Chopper in this case, just because I feel like Chopper has so many other uses in terms of combat, whereas with Sanji, it would be really nice to see him feeding Luffy actually being a huge help to Luffy in combat, because usually Sanji's cooking outside of specifically Whole Cake Island is not a major necessity in a given arc. So I like the idea that Sanji's value to Luffy could be huge, literally in terms of Sanji helping cook for him to help him win his final battles. In general, I do think that the, the time limit with Luffy's gears are getting a little bit they're just tighter than you would expect them to be. I mean, Luffy's already back in year fifth, but it's kind of like, how much longer is this gonna go on before he needs some sort of food again to get him back in fighting shape? And again, unless Sanji really gets involved and Oda's kind of setting all this up for, for Sanji to be a crucial element of Luffy's most important battles and kind of connect that aspect of their relationship together, which I think would be really, really good. Unless that's gonna happen, I kind of just find the short time limit on gear fifth to kind of be a little bit irritating and time consuming at the moment, because at the moment, all it's really doing is taking up panel time, right? We had to take up panel time last chapter for Luffy to go out of gear fifth and the giants to feed him and then Luffy to get back in shape and then, you know, try a red rock attack before finally cycling back this chapter to him just being in gear fifth again, trying again against Warkiri. Whereas if Luffy didn't have the time limit, we could have saved all of those pages and all of that panel space for, I guess, more interesting stuff. So that aside, very minor gripe with what's going on because everything else is absolutely amazing and definitely, definitely looking forward to next chapter and watch out for next week's video to fill your one piece break because I think it is going to be a huge one that explains how the mother flame connects into everything, the Will of D, the Void Century conflict, and what's going to happen in the future of the story. So watch out for that, and I'll talk to you all later.